uh, book and Hope again. Um, I want to put in another plug. Dr. Sturman Humbly uh, did not say that he is the president of the American um, Association of Bronchology and Interventional Pulmonology. So, um, as you may know, the uh, World Congress of Bronchology is going to take place in Cleveland in June. So, for anybody who's interested, it's, it's going to be a really wonderful gathering of people in, in the field of bronchoscopy and interventional pulmonology. I want to spend the next uh, 20 minutes or so talking about um, non-interventional procedure, which is basic TBNA. And if we're not doing EBUS, what could we do to improve our yield with conventional TBNA? Um, I don't have any conflicts of interest uh, related to this talk from a financial perspective, and my clinical and research conflicts of interest are primarily on um, malignant pleural disease, um, endobronchial ultrasound, and central airway obstruction. So I want to take uh, some time to review the current staging system, talk about why it's important to do TBNA, be it conventional or EBUS, uh, talk really about conventional TBNA, and then a little bit on image guidance, um, mainly CT fluoroscopy. Dr. Kovitz is going to follow this lecture on endobronchial ultrasound. So we all know that lung cancer is a bad disease and it's directly related to stage. The more advanced your stage, the worse your prognosis. And a lot of this relates to the lymph nodes. And what I've outlined in red um, are the patients who are potentially operable, right? You could cure their lung cancer by taking it out. And there are two mistakes that we can make to our patients. One is a mistake of omission where we're not operating on patients who are potentially curable. And the other is a mistake of commission, where we're <laughs> operating on patients who have no benefit of resection. And the big difference in these is our ability to separate out patients with N2 versus N3 disease. So we not, not only need to identify these patients before sending them to the operating room, but we're now no noticing that patients with multi-stage N1 disease do worse than patients with un un unistation N1 disease. Um, and the only way to identify those patients without surgery is with TBNA. One of the key things is to know where these lymph nodes are, know the revised lymph node map. And compared with prior lymph node maps, the um, one published by Roosh in Journal of Thoracic Oncology, they don't differentiate stations. What they do differentiate though is location. So what used to separate out left from right, for example, 4L from 4R, was the midline of the trachea. Now it's the left lateral border of the trachea. So you have to understand where these lymph nodes live and the implications for the staging. Now, can non-invasive staging help? Well, n a standard CAT scan using 10 millimeter um, short axis dimension, is the sensitivity is only about 60%, a little bit better than the flip of a coin. Um, PET CT also, not great. Uh, the sensitivity is about 85 to 90%. Same thing with the specificity. And both of these um, methods are less accurate for early stage disease and restaging after neoadjuvant chemotherapy and radiation. Now, clinical stage can markedly differ than uh, pathologic stage. About a quarter of our patients are clinically overstaged, 20% are clinically understaged. And in two papers, um, 190 clinical N2 patients, 38% of them were pathologic N0, which means that based on radiology, you would have said these patients have N2 disease, don't operate on them. But when you go in and identify those nodes, those nodes were not involved with cancer, they were false positive PET scans, and those are potentially curable patients. Likewise, in almost 200 patients that were clinically N2 negative, about 30% of them had pathologic N2 involvement. So these are patients who you would have been operating on that you shouldn't have been operating on. And because of that, our major societies, the ATS, ERS, European Society of Thoracic Surgery, really mandate tissue evaluation before <laughs> surgical resection. Uh, my old boss, uh, Dr. Malcolm DeCamp, a thoracic surgeon, uh, used to say that if you don't look at the lymph nodes, everyone has stage one disease. So you have to look at the lymph nodes. When we look at the ACCP recommendations, uh, the top uh, is from 2003 and the, the bottom is from 2007, you look at the uh, sensitivities and um, you know, performance characteristics of the variety of tests. Here, TBNA was listed at 76% back in 2003. They didn't even talk about EBUS. Um, however, in the most recent uh, recommendations, you could see that EBUS is better than mediastinoscopy. So EBUS is really the standard of care. It's the, it's the way to go. 
Why is that? Well, mediastinoscopy was considered the gold standard. I would say it's probably more of a tin standard. Uh, the downsides are that it's invasive expensive, but the amazing thing was this paper by Little in 2005 in that in the United States it was only performed in 27% of patients undergoing surgical resection. And when it was performed, lymph nodes were obtained in less than 50%. That is the gold standard of which we're basing mediastinal staging on. So the surgeons would make an incision, say, ah, I don't see any lymph nodes, and stop, and, and bill for the procedure. Um, but this is the problem with mediastinoscopy. It's, it's not the gold standard. And Kevin's going to talk about how EBIS is probably the gold standard now. So tDNA was uh, first performed by uh, Eduardo Schiapade, who is um, an Argentinian pulmonologist, and then really uh, came into practice by Dr. Copen Wong, who I have the pleasure of working with uh, several times a week at Hopkins. Uh, he took an esophageal Barrett's needle, passed through a rigid bronchoscope, and then Kenkicho Oho in Japan developed a needle that would fit through a flexible bronchoscope. So uh, Dr. Wong was very kind to lend me some of these slides. This is the very first tBNA ever performed, um, and you can see a, a large right upper lobe mass. This is the needle that he used and passed it through the rigid bronchoscope, and this is the first cytologic specimen from tBNA ever. Uh, so it, it's always good to go back in history and, and see how, A, we develop these things, but B, also see how this is what we're getting now. So in the past 30 plus years, nothing changes. We have this great poster um, at Hopkins. This is left heart catheterization by the transbronchial route. Um, and it says, more than 700 patients, no uh, death or important complications. So this is left heart catheterization where they're intentionally sticking a needle into the left atrium via the rigid bronchoscope. Um, and this is how it was done. Um, you could see the needle right here going into the left atrium. They would measure transmitral gradients prior to surgery um, and never a complication. Okay, so don't worry if you stick a needle into the aorta or the pulmonary artery. These guys stuck their left atrium and, and nothing bad happens. So the benefits of tBNA are that we could hit every single station. Unlike uh, mediastinoscopy or EUS, we could hit every station level. Um, we could couple staging with um, diagnostic bronchoscopy. So for example, if you have a right upper lobe mass, a station 7 lymph node, if we're getting lymphocytes but no cancer on the lymph node, then we could go on and sample the mass. Um, it's very safe, it's inexpensive, and it could also preclude surgery in up to 66% of patients. The big problems with tBNA is that it's underused. Um, a recent, uh, or it's not that recent anymore, but a survey um, that was published in CHEST um, about 20 years ago showed that only 12% of pulmonologists were routinely using tBNA in the evaluation of malignant disease. And the reason is that the operators were not getting the results that Dr. Wong was getting. You know, Dr. Wong's yield was 90%, and um, if you start learning this and don't do it often, your yields are not going to be that high, and then you, you stop doing it. Also, we're not getting the needle in the lymph node, and that really depends on lymph node size and station. The biggest risk of tBNA, and EBIS for that matter, is injury to the bronchoscope. It's very, very hard to hurt your patient with tBNA. You have to really try to hurt your patient. Um, you can hurt your bronchoscope, and, and that's another reason that people don't do it. It's the reason people don't do EBIS. They start doing EBIS, they puncture their bronchoscope, and it says, I don't want to do any more repair on this. So this says, uh, pull out better, you've hit an artery. Um, and, and, that, and that's exactly what you should do. So if you get blood, pull the needle out and go for a different location. You don't have to worry about it. And again, this is a picture from Dr. Haponik uh, when he was at Hopkins. This is, uh, uh, again, sticking the needle right into the left atrium. Um, and this is a paper from our, our work in Boston, um, which I'll show you a little bit later, uh, with the needle going right into the aorta. Nothing bad happens. Other risks, very safe procedure. Again, overall complication rate, uh, less than 2%. Um, as we just heard, it's good to report your uh, mistakes, and this is why the list has so many things on it, but it's, it's very rare. If you have a complication from tBNA, you should probably write it up. There are four basic techniques that everybody should learn, um, and you should master at least two of them. Um, the jabbing method, um, which we will practice later, involves pushing the catheter sheath into the uh, lymph node, keeping the bronchoscope stable. The piggyback method involves advancing both the catheter and the bronchoscope at the same time. 
the hub against the wall is where you put the hub of the needle and then advance the needle. And then the cough method is where you ha have the patient assist you. Uh, they cough and push the airway mucosa onto the needle. My favorite two techniques are the jabbing and the coughing. Um, you could almost always get in there with a the jab. It does take coordination between you as the operator and your assistant. Um, sometimes with very hard lymph nodes, be it from sarcoidosis or lymphoma, uh, the cough actually helps a lot. Um, and that's one of the problems of propofol now. We're using <coughs> propofol and LMAs and 98% of our patients, they don't have a cough anymore. Uh, so the moderate sedation is actually a, a good thing for that. The things that will help with this, um, you really want the minimal needle tip exposed. So what we'll do is we'll put the um, sheath out, just so we see the very, very tip of the sheath. We'll extend the needle in the central airway. We'll pull the needle back till we see just the very tip of it, drive to where we want to be. Now the key in this step is that if you ever lose the needle tip, if you ever don't see the needle tip, you have to communicate with your assistant pull it back into the sheath, otherwise you could damage your bronchoscope. However, once you are there, you want to be as perpendicular as you can and then jab it straight into the airway wall. The important notes of TBNA is that TBNA needs to be the first procedure. Again, if you have that patient with the right upper lobe mass and lymphadenopathy, you do not want to sample the mass first and then go for the lymph nodes for two reasons. One you're subjecting your patients to all the risks of transbronchial biopsy, which are significantly higher than the risks of TBNA, pneumothorax, and bleeding. Um, and two, you could potentially falsely upstage your patient. If there are a couple of cancer cells that come out and get into the needle or the bronchoscope sheath, you will falsely upstage your patient. You also have to do the highest stage nodes first. So for that right upper lobe mass, you do the N3 nodes first, your 4L, um, then you work to N2 nodes, your station 7, your 4R, and then if you want, you could do your N1 nodes, mainly to prove cancer. It's not going to change the um, practice thereafter. You'll still do surgery, but you don't have to sample the right upper lobe mass. Um, you have to process all of the material, right? So you have to communicate with your pathologist and talk about specimen processing. Um, you could do a filter clot method, which is what we do, is we put um, our specimen out on a piece of filter paper, it absorbs a lot of the blood cells, and we get a coagulum that we send for both formalin as well as cell block. You could do all sorts of molecular analyses looking uh, for EGFR, KRAS, P53 mutations, you could do fish, uh, you could do excited hybrid hybridization on all of those specimens. The main reasons for not in diagnostic sampling is you're not working well together as a team. You know, I was always taught First you blame your cytopathologist, oh, they're, they're not right. Then you blame your equipment, then you blame your assistant, and then you've got to take responsibility, right? You have to work together as a team with your assistant. Other factors are that your needle doesn't penetrate the wall completely, your angle of penetration was off, and believe it or not, your targets could move, and I'll show you some of those data in a little bit. How many aspirates should we do? There are two big studies on this. The first was by Ed Ponick. Uh, looked at over 450 aspirates in 71 patients. Um, here, interestingly enough, they found that ROSE, which is rapid on-site evaluation, where you have your cytologist there, matters. Um, having your cytologist there in conventional TBNA seemed to increase your yield. Um, however, there was a law of diminishing return. After about the third needle pass, you don't get much more bang for your buck. Right? But you have to do at least three passes per lymph node station. If you're not, you're um, not getting the highest yield you should. And the, the subsequent study was by Andreas Daikon, over 1,500 needle passes. Um, again, um, good yield for cancer, not so much for non-cancer diagnoses, but it, um, the yield was also after about uh, the third pass. So you should do at least three passes per station. You have to know your anatomy. Um, Dr. Wong published a wonderful lymph node map and how it correlates to the bronchoscopic image and I encourage everybody to go back to this paper from 1994 to look where these lymph nodes live. The one problem with this is that he called uh, station 4L the left paratracheal or AP window. Right? So we as pulmonologists should not be calling this the AP window. And the reason is that the surgeons and the radiologists are calling the AP window stations 5 and 6 which are 
lateral to the ligamentum arteriosum. We can't hit those uh, with TBNA. We've, we've hit those with EBIS intentionally going through and through the pulmonary artery, um, but it's generally something that we don't <coughs> aim for. Uh, so we call it 4L, um, but we should not be calling it the AP window. Now hitting a moving target, uh, lymph nodes move, right? So we always look at the inspiratory breath hold CT and we use the carina as a reference point. So if we are looking at the CAT scan and we see station 4R and these are five millimeter slice CAT scans and we scroll back and we say, ah, this lymph node is two centimeters proximal to the carina at two o'clock, you know where you need to go. The problem is bronchoscopy is dynamic. And this one study um, published in chest in 2007 showed that the mean um, movement was about five millimeters. Um, more than 60% of lymph nodes moved more than five centimeters, and the, only 25% of the nodes were stationary. So you have to think about where the CAT scan was obtained, right? which is usually an inspiratory breath hold. If we're doing the CAT, uh, our TBNA, with the patient doing spontaneous respiration, you may want the patient to take a breath in and stick the needle at that same time. Other tricks that we could do is flip the CAT scan. So when we're first starting to do TBNA, this is a very useful technique. As you get more experienced and are able to do this in your mind's eye, you don't need to do this. This is how we're normally looking at a CAT scan, right? So this is station 4L lymph node, where it's superior to the carina. You have the aorta, your SVC, your descending aorta, and this is 4L. It's good sometimes to flip the CAT scan, which you could do either on the films or with um, digital imaging. You could actually rotate this. And this is the view from the bronchoscopist perspective. Now I'm here and I see at 9 o'clock, right, I'll be sticking 4L. And you can measure the distance proximal to the main carina in order to do that. So you need to be able to get this stuff into your mind's eye. Other things to do to improve your yield with conventional TBNA use a bigger needle. Um, so it's been shown that histology needles, a 19 gauge needle, has a higher sensitivity than a cytology or a 22 gauge needle. Um, it's important to do a lot of TBNA. Experience counts. Just like any other procedure, be it cabbages and gallbladder surgery, the more you do, the better you are, the less complications that you have. And then rapid on-site evaluation. How, ma how many people um, have the luxury of having cytopathology at the bedside. Yeah, so it's actually a good thing. There, there are data um, that are controversial in terms of what it does to your yield. One of the most important things that it does is it decreases complications. And I, and I missed the reference, but there is a, a recent publication in Respirology looking at a decrease in complication rate of 20% down to 6%. And the reason was not from TBNA. The complications from TBNA were the same. It's just that with rapid onsite evaluation, you didn't have to subject the patient to transbronchial biopsy or lavage or brushing or any of that. And those, again, have a much higher uh, incidence of complications than TBNA. How about real time guidance aside from EBUS? Um, so, back at, uh, in Boston, uh, the quick check doing CT fluoro was started. So 12 patients with a prior non-diagnostic TBNA were referred for CT guided fluoro and the diagnosis was made in all patients. Uh, the interesting thing is that you were able to see where your needle was. So in experienced bronchoscopist hands, and I'm, I'm, when I'm talking about experienced bronchoscopist, uh, Dr. Ernst was uh, the lead author on this study, perhaps one of the most experienced bronchoscopists, only 33% of the needle passes were initially put into the target. Okay, so it's hard to do. 40% were not in an appropriate target, and 5% were into a major vessel. Okay, so it happens. Don't be, you don't don't take it personally when you get blood back. It happens even in Dr. Ernst's hands, um, and very minimal radiation exposure using this method. In a follow-up study of 32 patients, um, the nice thing about this study is that they um, excluded patients who had station 4R or station 7 involvement. And the reason is those are probably the easiest stations to hit with conventional TBNA. So you had to have a prior non-diagnostic bronchoscopy if you were using 4R or 7 as those targets. 
Um, adequate tissue is obtained in almost 90% and the diagnosis was made in almost 70%. So CT fluoro before EBUS seemed to be a very nice way to guide your needle. Um, and this is the way that it's done. So I'm, I'm a tall guy, so it was relatively easy for me to do bronchoscopy in the CT scanner like this. Um, but it, it's a little bit cumbersome, right? You have to arrange radiation time with your um, radiologist, right? You need to borrow their CT scanner for maybe up to 40, 60 minutes. They could be doing lots of other scans in that time. So you have to have that infrastructure in place. But what you see is the, the bronchoscopic CAR image, uh, your CT fluoro image. You could actually see the needle right here in station seven. Uh, this is another example of a, uh, station 4R, uh, another example of a station 4R. So it, it is very nice. Now, how about the needle? There are lots of different needles. I'm not paid by any company. Um, you have to just get familiar with one needle. Um, just like you get familiar with the drugs that you use for intubation, you're, you're familiar with, uh, for example, Atomidate and succinylcholine, or propofol and succinylcholine. Uh, you get familiar with one and you know how to use it, same thing with the needle. And it's not so much for you, but it's for whoever's helping you. It's very important. Now, it's interesting that what's old is new again. Uh, this is Dr. Wong's first needle, which you notice has a stylet in it. Um, and perhaps that's why his yield was so high. The new EBUS needles also have a stylet, and Dr. Kovitz may talk about this, the stylet may be one of the most important things to increase your yield because it's going to get rid of all the bronchial mucosa and cartilage from that initial needle penetration. Uh, so Dr. Wong is a very firm believer of using a stylet. The needle that I use during conventional TBNA doesn't have a stylet. Our, our yield is still pretty decent. So what I tried to do in the last uh, 20 or so minutes, uh, really tell you that TBNA is underutilized. We should be doing TBNA all the time. Um, it's a very, very safe procedure. Uh, conventional TBNA can obviate the need for surgery in 30 to 60 percent of patients, depending on how good you are. Uh, EBUS is significantly better than that. It's important to tell your patients that non-diagnostic does not mean negative. Right? So when a patient comes in and we're doing TBNA, I tell them that if we don't get an answer with this, we still have to go on to the next step, right? So if I get lymphocytes or if I don't get an answer, a definitive answer, meaning if I don't get cancer or sarcoidosis or something like that, we have to go on to the next step. We can't say that a non-diagnostic TBNA is a true negative until it's either confirmed surgically or confirmed with appropriate length clinical follow-up. And then we also have to incorporate conventional TBNA into our algorithm. If you have one EBUS bronchoscope, you can't be doing four EBUS procedures a day, right? You have to do a procedure, process the scope for another 40 minutes, and it's very inefficient that way. So you can't do cases back to back. You need at least two EBUS bronchoscopes if you're gonna be doing EBUS several times a day. So what do you do for your second patient? Do you do regular TBNA? Are you going to do all patients regular TBNA and then use EBUS as a rescue? If you don't, if your cytopathologist there says, you know, we don't have an answer, do you then do EBUS? Or um, you have to figure out how you're going to use blind or conventional TBNA if you have EBUS available. We have EBUS available. We generally don't do conventional TBNA. Uh, we're actually starting a study now on the incremental yield of EBUS in people who are quote unquote experts at conventional TBNA. So we're having Dr. Wong, uh, myself, my partner, you know, people who have done a lot of TBNA. We're going to start doing conventional TBNA in a, in a blinded fashion and then do EBUS. Because that's never been shown. It's never been shown that EBUS actually improves your yield if you learn conventional TBNA the right way. We know EBUS has an outstanding yield, but it's never been, the incremental yield on conventional TBNA has never been shown. Uh, so with that, I'd be happy to entertain any questions, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you.